Hello, everyone, and thank you very much. And it's wonderful to have you here today, Mary Ann. And if anyone hasn't read this book, I would recommend it's an absolute must read for all humans, not just women. But I think particularly not just women. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we wanted to start by doing like defining what is the authority gap. Yeah, so the authority gap is the extent to which we still take men more seriously than women. We're still more reluctant to accord authority to women, and we still resist their authority when they are in power. So women are twice as likely as men to say that they often have to provide evidence of their competence. Uh, they're nearly twice as likely as men to say people are often surprised at their ability. Women of color are twice as likely as white women to say both of these things. Women are nearly twice as likely as men to say they often find it hard to get their views accepted in a meeting unless someone else repeats them. I'm sure some of you have had this experience. And this is not just anecdotal, so there's all sorts of academic evidence to back it up. So women, for instance, are much more likely to be interrupted than men. And interruption is actually a, you know, a very negative thing to happen to you because A, it suggests that the person who's doing the interrupting has something more interesting and more important to say than you have. And B, it actually stops you in your tracks and it silences you. Now, you might think that these sorts of things don't happen to senior women, to authoritative women. I'm afraid they happen to all women. So there was a fascinating academic study which looked at uh, proceedings of the US Supreme Court. And you don't get much more authoritative than being a US Supreme Court justice, right? Uh, but what it found was that although women made up only a third of the justices, they suffered two thirds of all interruptions. In other words, they were four times more likely to be interrupted than their male counterparts, 96% of the time by men. And this starts really young. So three-year-old boys are more likely to interrupt three-year-old girls than they are to interrupt other boys. It is absolutely hardwired into us that we don't respect girls and women as much as we respect boys and men. And I'd just to give you an anecdote of how this happens even at the very highest levels, because I interviewed about 40 really senior and powerful women in the course of researching this book, because my thesis was, if this, e if this is even happening to them, then it's pretty much proof that it's happening to the whole of womankind. And the story I start the book with came from Mary McAleese, who was then, who, sorry, had been president of Ireland. And when she was president, she led a state visit to the Vatican to meet the Pope. So incredibly formal occasion, and there she is standing at the head of her delegation in the audience room. In comes the Pope, flanked by his cardinals, to be introduced to the president. He walks straight past her, sticks out his hand to her husband instead, who's standing next to her, and says, wouldn't you prefer to be president of Ireland rather than married to the president of Ireland? Her delegation was stunned. I mean, it was so rude and such a breach of diplomatic protocol apart from anything else. But of course, her husband knew better than to take the Pope's hand. So Mary McAleese grabbed this hand, which was hovering in midair, brought it back to herself and said, let me introduce myself. I am the president of Ireland, Mary McAleese, elected by the people of Ireland, whether you like it or whether you don't. Now, the Pope said afterwards, oh, I'm so sorry, I heard you had a sense of humor. Right, this quite often happens, <laughs> can't you take a joke? And she said, I do have a sense of humor, but that wasn't funny because you wouldn't have done it to a male president. And so what happens as a result of the authority gap is that women are routinely underestimated, disrespected, like Mary McAleese. Um, they are often patronized, mistaken for someone more junior. They're much more likely to be interrupted or talked over to have their expertise challenged, less likely to be listened to when they put their views across, and more likely to have their authority resisted. One of the things I thought was interesting in the book, and obviously as a female CEO, I was kind of reading the book conscious of what I have done in my own career and my style. Mm. But one of the things you talk about is it isn't for women just about their competence, it's all about needing this warmth and likability to be able to kind of succeed. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yes, so women are in a real double bind. Because you might say, oh, well, the reason that women tend to be respected less than men and taken less seriously than men is they don't portray their views confidently enough. And men are much more confident than women, and that's why we listen to them more. Well, it's certainly true that boys and men are, on average, more confident than girls and women. 
and that's because of the way we've been socialised. So if you look at boys talking and playing and socialising together, a lot of it consists of a sort of boastful competitiveness, you know, oh, my dad's got a better car than yours, or I've scored more goals this season than you. you know, with girls, it's exactly the opposite. Any girl who behaved like that would be immediately ostracised. Nobody likes a boastful girl, is what we all get to told as children. And so girls bond by doing the opposite, by being modest and self-deprecating. And adult women, for that matter. So, you know, so girls will say, oh, I'm useless at maths, or I hate my hair, I can't do anything with it, or my bum's too big. Right? And that's the way we are taught to behave. And so it's not enough to say, well, send women on assertiveness training courses and all this will be solved. Because if we do start to behave like men and start to behave as confidently and as assertively as men, people really dislike it. And they recoil. And they start to use words about us like, oh, she's quite aggressive, isn't she? Or she's abrasive or strident, bossy, overbearing, scary, even bitchy, ball-breaking. And these are words never used of men showing exactly the same character traits. And so we have this problem that we're either not confident enough and therefore we're disrespected, we are confident enough and therefore we're disliked. <laughs> and you may say, well, grow thicker skin and who cares if you're disliked? Well, actually, the research shows that likability is a much more important factor for women than it is for men when it comes to being hired or being promoted, particularly if it's men doing the hiring or the promoting. And therefore, the only way through this is to layer a huge amount of warmth onto your personality to try to mitigate any hostility that you might otherwise attract, basically for being confident and good at your job. And it's exhausting. You know, we have to sort of smile a lot. I've really noticed in the era of Zoom how much I smile when I'm talking. And it's not deliberate, it's just sort of conditioned in me. So, you know, we have to smile more, we have to crack jokes, we have to be much more emotionally intelligent, we have to read the room very carefully, you know, be careful not to tread on any male egos uh, in order not to um, be disliked. And this is, as I said, exhausting. It's something that some women aren't particularly good at, and why should they be? And it's a burden that men simply don't have to bear. No, it was funny because when I was reading this book, I was thinking, gosh, there was a lot of moments I'm thinking, yes, I remember doing that. Or, yes. And obviously, I know one of the things also is if you've got a regional accent and also the tone at which we speak, because we're taught to kind of ex listen to male voices equivalent authority and they tend to have a lower pitch. Mm. And I know that's something some of your some of the people you talk to talk about in their interviews, how they've sort of changed their vocal range or been very conscious of it. Yeah, I mean, it, so it is certainly true that we associate lower voices with authority. The lower your voice, the more authoritative you sound. Now, of course, it's hard to disentangle, is that because we associate male with authority and men tend to have lower voices? But it's even true within the sexes. So, you know, men with a high voice, we tend to laugh at a bit, you know, the sort of David Beckham's of this world. Um, and, and women with high voices actually sound childish in a way that men can't because their voices break. So we are always told, lower your voice if you want to have more authority. And one of the really interesting uh, research studies I came across showed that over the past few decades, in more egalitarian countries, the average pitch of a woman's voice has declined dramatically. Whereas in inegalitarian countries like Japan, it stayed much higher. Mm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It's all subconscious, but we've, we've, we've realized we need to sound like men for anyone to listen to us. <laughs> but one of the things I think you talk about when you talk about the data from the pandemic or you talk about the growth of businesses who have more women on the board is you talk about actually having women also being part of the authority actually improves performance. So yeah. if you talk a little bit that we all flourish men, women, everyone, humanity flourishes. I mean, it's a no-brainer, basically, if you're an employer. You can get twice the size of the talent pool if you, if you actually take women as seriously as men. Um, but a lot of men think, oh, I'm not sure about this, what's in it for me? Surely, as women rise, I will fall. It's like a sort of seesaw, it's a zero-sum game. And actually, what really cheered me up in doing the research for this book is that it's not, it's a positive-sum game. So we all know the statistics about how more diverse leadership in companies leads to greater shareholder returns. Uh, we know that more women in parliaments around the world actually tend to create better laws, tends to be less corruption, tends to be less war and less civil war. So there are all these sorts of um, top-down statistics. But even from the bottom up as well, your lives individually as men will actually be happier if you live in a more, both in a more egalitarian society, the research shows, 
and in more egalitarian personal relationships, straight relationships, that is, in which the man and the woman share the chores pretty equally and the childcare pretty equally, not only are the women happier and healthier, which you would expect, and less exhausted and less resentful, um, and the children are happier and healthier, and they do better at school, and they have fewer behavioral difficulties, and the girls are more ambitious for their lives, and the boys are less likely to get into trouble, and they have better relationships with their dads. So all those you would expect. But actually, the men themselves are happier and healthier. So they are twice as likely to say they're satisfied with their lives. I mean, that is huge, twice as likely. Half as likely to be depressed, much less likely to get divorced, and they tend to smoke less, drink less, take fewer drugs, get more sleep at night, and here is the absolute clincher. They get more frequent and better sex. <laughs> so, guys, this is really in your interest, I promise you. <laughs> but to Rory's point, we should take this to the NHS because it would <laughs> save the NHS so much money. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a new way to solve the problem. Mm. Um, I think one of the pieces in the last chapter is you have incredibly helpful actions that we can take. So, to your point, while obviously a lot of the women that you've interviewed set out the challenges, you have incredibly helpful actions. Do you want, I mean, they go from very much what you can do in the media, and I thought maybe we could start a bit with the portrayal in the media and marketing, given a lot of the audience of this room. Yeah, so in the media, many more male experts than female experts tend to get quoted, which subliminally gives us the notion that men know more than women. That's starting to change, at least in organisations that are trying to do something about it. So the BBC actually has launched a sort of 50-50 campaign to try to get as many female experts as male experts on air. It's not, very, it's not hard to find them. There are plenty of women out there who are experts. It's just that they tend to have been quoted less in the past by male journalists, and so they're lower down the Google search, but, you know, they are there. Um, so that makes a difference. Um, there are fewer female columnists than male columnists on average. So again, the columnists and the critics are the people who we look to as sources of authority on a subject. And that, uh, again, some papers are good about it. The Guardian, where I'm a director, is now very good, but some papers are not. So that's also perpetuating the notion. In movies, men have twice as many speaking parts as women do. They have, the male characters have more agency than the female characters. Um, the women are much more likely to be cast as either sex objects or help meets or murder victims, uh, whereas it's the men who are doing all the interesting stuff. That is starting to change, like I would say. Like has yeah, its own production exactly. company. exactly. So I just in the last only three or four years, but thank God that is starting to change. Same with children's books, same with TV dramas. It's just starting to change at the edge. In advertising, there is now this uh, regulation that says that you shouldn't be able to, um, um, to sort of patronize people. I, th I think harmful gender stereotypes have been banned. Yeah. So you can't do an ad showing a man sort of struggling to change a nappy or a woman sort of not being able to change a tire. But the, the, the more subtle gender stereotypes still run all the way through advertising, I'm afraid. Well, and I think there's a lot we'll more that can be done about that. <laughs> And then you talk a bit as well, like as parents, it might be good for some of the people in the room to not worry if you're a major carer of people. What from an early age can you think about with your children or children you're involved in the lives of? Yeah, well, one of the most shocking pieces of research I came across showed that parents, when asked to estimate their children's IQ, estimated their sons on average at 115. And you're a numerate audience, so you know that that in itself is hilarious because the average ought to have come out at 100. Um, but their sons at 115, and their daughters at only 107. Now, that is really shocking because we all know that boys' and girls' IQs are, on average, identical, except at the very, very far extremes of the bell curve. And yet, parents think their sons are cleverer than their daughters. So boys are growing up subliminally absorbing this incorrect notion that they're cleverer than girls, and girls are growing up absorbing this incorrect notion they're less clever than boys, despite the fact that they develop faster than boys, have a bigger vocabulary than boys, and outperform boys at every academic level from kindergarten to PhD. <laughs> so to start with, please don't underestimate your daughters and overestimate your sons. Um, secondly, don't praise your daughters for being pretty and your sons for achieving things. And this happens so much that we basically reward girls for being ornamental and boys for being instrumental. And say they, so girls grow up thinking, the main currency for me is appearance and I need to be pretty, I need to be thin. And boys grow up thinking, I'm going to be a great footballer, or I can, I'm brave, I can climb trees, or I'm doing really well at school. 
And then, of course, don't stereotype the chores that they do at home or the toys that you think they might want to play with. So, for instance, up to the age of 18 months, boys are just as interested as girls in playing with dolls. Isn't that interesting? But then parents start policing what they play with. Particularly fathers start policing their sons. So you can't play with that, that's a girl's toy. Why is it a girl's toy? Playing with dolls allows you to, 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 to learn empathy, to put yourself in someone else's position, to act out the sort of interactions that you have in everyday life and make sense of them. It's nothing to do with being a boy or a girl. And then I suppose the last one is as employers, because I think a lot of progress has been made in terms of people being more aware of unconscious bias or blind CVs. Mm. But is there anything you think as employers in this room that we could kind of make the next step on? Well, I think one of the things you can really do is look at the culture in your organisation. So you may well be promoting women faster than you used to, and you may be starting to improve life for them. But when it comes to the everyday interactions, which is what I'm at least partly writing about, are their voices being heard as much as men in meetings? Are they being interrupted more than men? Are people ignoring their views until a man makes exactly the same point and it's treated like the second coming? You know, and, and, and if that's the case, be an ally to them. You know, so you know, if you get interrupted, then I would say, oh, hang on, I was really interested in what Fiona was saying there. Or you know, suppose you make a point and no one takes you notice until the man repeats it 10 minutes later. I can say, oh, I'm so glad you agree with what Fiona said earlier. <laughs> You know, so we, don't, we should all be very alert to this. But there are also very good research-based methods that improve prospects for women. So, for instance, did you know that having only one woman on a selection panel actually reduces the chances of a woman being hired? Because what happens is that the men think, oh, we don't have to worry about all this diversity stuff, the woman will take care of that. And the woman thinks, I shouldn't recommend the female candidate because all these men will think I'm being nepotistic. And therefore, you always need more than one woman on a selection panel. And you also need more than one woman on a shortlist, because otherwise, you're giving the subliminal idea that if it's five to one, then on average, men are five times better at this job than women are. But there are many more suggestions in, in the last chapter. Yeah, I think I would definitely, for everyone, I would read everything, but I would definitely <laughs> focus on some of the tangible actions, because they are fantastic to help you drive forward. And, and in fact, I, I would just say broadly, uh, two, two points on this. One is, we should acknowledge that however liberal or intelligent or nudge stock attending we are, or even female, the chances are that we probably do harbour unconscious bias against women. I know I do. And, but, but what we can do, because it's unconscious, we can't change it. We needn't feel ashamed of it. We can't put a lid on it. But we can notice when it manifests itself and then do something to correct it. So I'm really asking just some more awareness in all of us. And secondly, I think one big lesson is don't confuse confidence with competence, because they're absolutely not the same thing. And understand how much harder it is for a woman to display the right amount of confidence. So enough to be respected, but not, not so much that she's disliked, whereas for men, it's a doddle. And you know, if a man tells you how great he is, don't take him at his word, examine his output. And if a woman is modest about her accomplishments, don't take her at her word, examine her output too. Yes, yeah, so it was a great quote from Julia Gillard, I thought, on that, where she like, talked about you know, being a doctor to one of her pushes back in one of the interviews she did, where I thought you know, she put someone in her place by noticing her competence, even if they didn't like her style, shall we yes, say. So. Yes. I mean, women, are, women with titles like doctor or professor, much less likely to be introduced by their title than men are. There are so many things like this that are sort of subcon done subconsciously that have a subconscious effect on us. Yes, well, we have a friend who's just become a dame, and we've told her to own it and tell everyone she's a dame. So Nothing like a dame. <laughs> so what would, gives you hope, though, moving forward? Because the book actually ends very hopefully. You have another quote from Mary McAleese at the end, which is like, when we all work together, we all flourish. And from all your studies and from the work you're still doing, talking about the, and the audiences you engage with, what gives you kind of hope of where we'll be maybe in 5, 10, 15 years' time? Well, OK, so my hope comes from the middle third of men and I'll explain that now. So about a third of men are already brilliant at this and will listen to us just as attentively as they'll listen to other men. They love working alongside women. They're happy to work for women. And they're great. And we notice it instantly. We love it. We really appreciate it. 
And then there's about a third of men at the other end of the spectrum who are, frankly, the dinosaurs. You know, it's not just unconscious, it's probably conscious bias. They genuinely think they're superior to us. Um, not really evidence-based, but nonetheless, I don't think they're going to read my book, and I don't think they're going to change their minds. But I do think that there is about a third of men in the middle who are not actively malign to women. They just don't notice that they take up disproportionate conversational time in a conversation. They'll talk twice as much as a woman they're talking to, talking to rather than with, you know, um, or that they interrupt women more than men, or if they walk up to a man and a woman standing together, they'll automatically address the man first before the woman, or if a man and a woman walk into a meeting, they'll assume she's his junior. But they're not doing this on purpose, or as I say, malignly. And I think they could become much more aware of their actions. And then you've got two-thirds of men being quite enlightened about this, who can call out the other third. And I, and I compare it, because of course if women call it out, a lot of men are just going to think, oh, la, 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 there she goes again. If other men call it out, I mean, this is part of the problem that I'm writing about in the book, that men listen to other men more than they listen to women. If other men call it out, they will start to take it more seriously. And I compare it to racism, say, 20 years ago, where if you had a bunch of white people in a room together, one of them might tell a casually racist joke and think it was a safe space to do it and would get away with it. That doesn't happen anymore, thank God. I would like that to be the case for sexism in 5, 10, 20 years' time, that if a man says something sexist, either just in a group of men or indeed in front of women, he can't get away with it either. So I think, thank you so much, Marianne, and hopefully we can all flourish. Thank you.